Hey church, hope you're well. Uh, I am really looking forward to Sunday and being with you in worship for many reasons, but one of them is we're going to begin a new preaching series uh, going through the letter of Colossians. Um, one of what's become one of my um, well, favorite is the right word, but really just incredibly formative letter for me. And I know for many of you as well, it was written by Paul. Paul is, as you probably know, was one of the early apostles. Apostle was just a person who was kind of like an entrepreneur or an explorer that God sent out in the early church to to the frontier, basically, into the Gentile world to plant churches and to proclaim the gospel. And Paul gets in trouble at one point for doing so. It wasn't received very well everywhere. And he ends up in prison in the city of Ephesus. And he um, gets a visit from a friend of his, a colleague, a partner in ministry named Epaphras, who comes with a report about how the various churches are doing. And he speaks to Paul about this church of the Colossians and Colossa, that was a city maybe 100 miles away from Ephesus. Paul had never visited there. He didn't plant this church, but he is eager to hear a good report about this congregation. It's doing well. You know, a lot of a lot of congregations over the over the years don't do well, but this one's doing well. It's it's, it's the faithful community, and they are seeking to follow Christ. And yet, at the same time, Epaphras brings some a bit of a warning that the church is under threat. It's it's uh, it's there are external factors that are threatening the church, um, and um, you know, it makes me interest. It, it's interesting to me if somebody were to give a report about Faith Church. Uh, what would be in that report? You know, would it, would it be an encouraging report? I think it would. But what threats do you think would be mentioned? What threats do we face as the congregation? External threats or internal threats? What threats does the American or Western church face? There are many. There are always threats to the church because there is evil in this world which stands against the church. Um, it's, it's a question worth considering and one we'll get into as we go through the series. Um, just to summarize this briefly, um, the threats were were kind of threefold. First, there was the, the threat of legalism, that there were many in the church that were being sold this idea that the way to salvation with God was through following the Torah, the, uh, the Jewish law, that the better you were, the more moral you were, the more you would be accepted by God. Um, and this is, of course, a threat today. It's all over the church. Uh, legalism is, is, is alive and well. Many people in, in churches... Uh, come to believe that God will favor them more or even allow them into heaven someday if they live a certain kind of life um, and prove themselves to God. But that threat is an old threat. It was threatening the, the church of the Colossians. The second one was the threat of Gnosticism. Gnosticism is an ancient philosophy still around today. Um, it's complicated, but essentially it was the idea that the real world, the material world, was evil and corrupt. And it was the job of people, the hope of people to escape the world into the spiritual. It's a very common philosophy today still. Um, and the salvation came through special knowledge, uh, through mystical special knowledge. Um, and that Jesus, Gnostics respected Jesus, but as one of many, many pathways to find salvation, to find God. Um, and so in those days, it was a real threat on Christ's nature. Um, for one, People couldn't believe that that Jesus was God because, uh, again, ma the material world is evil and God would never take up residence in a, a human body of flesh and bone. That would just be beyond uh, comprehension. Um, and Jesus was considered just one of many ways to God. I hope you know and understand that is a, that is a that threat is alive and well today. Uh, both the idea that the material world is somehow not valuable to God or even corrupt, and also the idea that um, that there are many other ways to God and Jesus is just one option. Um, kind of the third threat of this for the church in those days was that these things came under the guise of Christianity. They weren't Christianity, but they came with that label, kind of like a Trojan horse. It looked like Christianity on the outside, and so the church might let it in, but once they open it up, it, it, would, it would corrupt the church. Um, and so... This is the context of Colossians, where Paul writes this letter to this this ancient community of believers. And though it's 2,000 years old, I have to tell you, it is incredibly relevant, speaks to some of the same threats that we face today. 
And because of the attack on the nature of Christ and who he was in those days, some of the most beautiful, stunningly beautiful writings about the nature of Christ in the New Testament are found in Colossians. Um, I'm really eager to, to jump into this letter with you and to journey through it together, um, beginning Sunday into the spring. would really encourage you to also watch the Bible Project video on Colossians that I linked in the, in the email. That will be also incredibly helpful to understand the context of this letter. Um, Sunday, we're going to just look focus on the first eight verses, chapter 1, verses 1 to 8, where Paul uh, expresses a deep and profound gratitude for the church. And we're going to think about uh, why that is and, and why I think uh, Paul would be grateful, and I am grateful as well, for the church I get to serve here at Faith. And what's the, what's the nature of that faith, and why are we so grateful for it, and to whom are we thankful for it? Um, really eager to share this message with you and be with you. Um, so looking forward to worshiping you on Sunday and wherever you are today, may you truly know the love of God as your father, the grace of, of, uh, of Christ, his son, and the peace, the presence of the Holy Spirit with you. Peace.